Why the title of this book, first of all? Why the title? Um, people always ask that question, why would you choose a title like that? I think the title creates dialogue. I think the title is, in, is one of those things where people look at it and they're like, what the hell? And so it's like, but the title is very, is needed because a lot of the issues that are deeply rooted in American history are things that make people uncomfortable, and particularly white people when it comes to the history of America and what, what, has, ha what has happened to brown and black people across America. And I think this title was something that, you know, it kind of irks them a little bit, but it's the reality of what, what it is to be an American citizen, to break down the cultural walls and what people are feeling through their history. And I think that's why I chose the title. And also it's a cool title, you know? Like who would, I mean, when I think about this title, I think about Richard Pryor, I think about those people who like inspired me to take risks like that, like to say things like that, Eddie Murphy, like those people who would be um, entertainers, but they would, you know, say shit that people wouldn't want people to say. So I just like, Dave Chappelle, like things to make white people uncomfortable, you know? I love oh. it. What, um, you know, there's a lot of folks who have these ridiculous stereotypes about athletes, especially black male athletes. Um, but here you are, an environmentalist, a feminist, an activist, an artist, all these different things. You know, how do you feel when people have tried to historically put you in a box, given all the interests that you have? It's funny, because I literally was just talking to um, my friend's kids a second ago, and we were literally talking about, you know, what it is to be dehumanized. I think a lot of times as an athlete, people dehumanize athletes. They don't connect us to being humans. So, so therefore, the things that we speak about aren't truth. The things our realities are, aren't what's really going on. They think because we're athlete that we're not attached to Black Lives Matter. We're not attached to police brutality. We're not attached to the issues in Palestine. We're not attached to Native Americans, Flint, Michigan. Everything that everybody else is attached to, we're not attached to it simply because we wear helmets. And I think that's what I think about when people try to tell us like, oh, why are you doing this and why are you doing that? I think it's about, for me personally, it's about being a human. How do I connect with other human beings that are going through different situations? And just because I get a label, does that label define me or do I define myself? And so while thinking deeply into these uh, thoughts about different issues is why I just do what I do. Because we want to want to break the mold of what people consider athletes and what is it to be an athlete? Is it just about scoring touchdowns or is it just about doing slam dunking or running fast? Or is it about really standing up on what you believe in? You know, people look at us as these superhuman things, but the, does the superhuman stop just on the field or does it continuously go outside of the field when you talk about issues that are deeply rooted in our communities? Well, I thought um, it was profound before hashtag Me Too exploded um, in the last seven, eight months. You were talking about the impact of your wife having three daughters on you as a man and how it helped you to rethink uh, not just manhood, but how you know, uh, women are equals. I mean, where did, how did you come to this? <laughs> I mean, my wife is like, she's a powerful being. She is like spiritually something that is amazing. So being around somebody like that, it kind of like, pushes you to be like that. So for when I'm with around women all day, I see the power of what a woman could do and how they could be. So whenever I'm with my daughters, you know, but. Hmm. Take your time. No, nah, but just when I think about my daughters, it's just so much. So. Well, we proud of you, I always get emotional when I talk about my daughters because they just mean so much. So, it, it, you know, it's fighting for women is fighting for them. So fighting for them is what I'm here for. So supporting women on everything is just amazing. All the women I get to meet along the way, whether it's Linda, Maya, Patrice, just women who are just the essence of what it takes to stand up on stuff. And so when you're around people like that, it pushes you to understand what it means and what it means to support a woman like my wife. I just try to do the best I can to support her, like, and try to understand and just listen to what it means to be, you know, a man who supports his wife or a man who supports women's rights. And every day I get tested, you know, being an athlete, you know, who's done so much in the sport. It's like people always try to define me by if I have a son or not, you know. And so a lot of times when you have those conversations with people about, like, what, why do I have to be defined by a son? Like, why can't I define by a what my daughter is created. So that's why.
I want to go back a bit and thank you for um, just the honesty and the vulnerability because it's rare and it's refreshing, especially as we talk about you know, this period that we're in with the women's marches, Me Too. Um, we need more men, examples like you. I need to say that publicly. Um, where are you from and, and, and can you talk about your childhood a bit? You know, I know you talk about it in the book, but for folks who haven't read the book yet. No, nah, I think I'm from Texas, but I was born in Louisiana, so I spent a lot of my childhood in between Louisiana and Texas. And my dad was in the military, so we always, when my dad, my mom had me at 16 years old, so, and she had my brother at 17, and my sister when she was 15. And so, you know, we had, we were a young family, and we moved a lot around America. So we started off in Washington, and we moved up and down the West Coast, and we ended up staying in San Diego for a long period of time. And um, so I spent a lot of my childhood in San Diego, and then when I was about nine or 10, we moved to Texas, and actually we moved to Louisiana first, and it was, me and my wife was talking about this other day, how like, I always say I'm country or whatever, but then it was like a culture shock to like, going to the country that I always heard about, like in Louisiana, and then being from the city, it was like, it was just different. Like the things that like, what I consider work was like washing dishes or like, you know, sweeping the floor. I'm like, dad, we did a good job. We could go outside now. But on my grandpa's, it was like, you know, we got to go out here. You got to move the tractor. You got to mow the yard. You got to got to help plant the vegetables. You got to do all this stuff. And like the whole summer, I felt like I was just working every single day. But that was who my grandfathers were. They were farmers and what they did and we ate what we cooked and when we ate what we grew and the whole summer was connected with a lot of all my nieces and nieces and nephews and my cousins and everybody was just there all the time so that's how I grew up a lot in the summertime but and then also my mom went to talked about this earlier but my mom went to a historically black college Grambling University and so I also spent a lot of time there too like doing um, NAACP camps, so learning about black history was, was something that I had instilled in me early because, you know, when you go with Eddie Robinson, who was the winning coach of all times in football, we would do football camps and we would do educational runs and we would learn about, so during the truth, we would learn about everybody that looked like us and everybody who contributed in a way to change society. So having those things in as a young kid, kind of propelled me into the to the man that I am now but also just my parents being super involved like my parents were always involved in the things that we had going whether it was sports or whether it was music or whether whatever it was my parents were the were always involved I remember my brother being six seven you know playing the trumpet or the tuba or something and it would just be funny but my parents were always super involved and I think that's why um, I'm able to do the things that I'm doing now because of the support that we had as, as young kids. So you would say you were exposed to a range of things, arts, sports, social justice issues. Yeah, my mom on. was a teacher. My mom is, still is a teacher. She's a teacher in the community. She's been there for 20 something years now. And I always grew up watching her like work and going to people's houses to get their kids to school and trying to help change that. My dad was a part of the school board, which I'm still trying to see how he won. I mean. <laughs> But that was one of his greatest things was to be a part of the school board and make the changes that he's seen. There were issues from our time growing up. So my parents are involved in the community. Everybody knows uh, my family and where I'm from and both sides in Louisiana and in Texas. So. so the seeds were planted early on. And, you know, a lot of folks I know have said that they had parent or parents who were as we say in 2018 woke. But there's a huge leap from knowing these things and being outspoken about it. When did that start for you? Uh, I think it started when I was in college. It was like, as, as I was in college and I was like learning more about, you know, from the chapter where I talk about the NCAA, like uh, to go into a white institution such as sports and when you go to college, it's, it's really hard on your psyche when you walk into a place and everything about you is like not important. The history of you, the contribution of what you've done to society, uh, the way the people look at you and dress, um, how you speak and, you know, a coach tries to personify his outlook on life on you and doesn't ever take the time to understand you as a person, you know. And so it was always hard when you were in college to do that, to try to find yourself and find out why do, don't people accept you for being you. So being in places like that was something that was always hard for me. So, mm. What did you study? What was your major? I studied sociology and... Mm stuff like that and our agriculture so agriculture is yeah. that because of the farming background or? no that was because that's what they wanted everybody to study doing football like everybody started <laughs> with their everybody started with one thing and then they were like 
now, hey, you know, this is going to be kind of hard for you to do and make it to the team or, or like try to like, you wow. know, it's always that's how sports is, though. It's like you want to do a certain thing, but the sport doesn't allow you to do a certain thing. Not because it's because of time. Like, you know, they say you're a student athlete first, but if you really track how many hours athletes spend in the classroom versus the field or in the weight room, like, you know, I grew up working, waking up at 5 a.m. to go work out and then trying to go to class and then, you know, try to play the game, then try to do a test. It's like that's a hard thing, you know, the hours of an athlete in college. You know, it's already hard for a regular student. But if you think about what an athlete does and, and not having much value when you talk to the coach. I remember, you know, I had my daughter at, at – well, my wife had her at 20. And so we, like, trying to be a parent in college and, like, telling my coach, like, look, man, like, I need to go home. Like, I understand that we have practice tomorrow, but right. my daughter's birthday is tomorrow. Like, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, I, what you – you don't – I. so it was always, like, a thing where they never respected me for a man. They always respected me for a thing. And so that's always a conflict when you're growing up and evolving as a human. Mm. And what's, can you say what school it was for folks who don't know? Oh, I went to Texas A&M. If you could wave a magic wand and change how women and men college athletes, uh, are, tr athletes are treated, what would you do? It's in the book, but so. I know, I know it's in the book. <laughs> but Y'all gotta buy the book, please. Or did they buy the book already? It's a lot there? of things, you know, like, you know, as we, as I'm in, thought about like things like, okay, sports, like there's things about sports that are beautiful. To be able to collaborate with people, to be able to work with people for one common goal is, it, is the goal for life. Like how do we come together and do something together collectively for the one, you know, for everybody. And it's like, so sports do that to you. But in NCAA, things I would change would be like athletes not getting paid money or athletes, uh, Injuries. I think injuries and dealing with depression is something that people don't talk to about sports because, you know, people like say like for me, like when I'm walking through the crowd, like people assume automatically that I want to take a picture. Right. Because I'm associated with entertainment. So therefore, when I'm off the field, I'm already seen as a piece of meat or I'm seen as entertainment, like regardless if I'm with my family or regardless if I'm, you know, walking with my doing whatever I need to do. I could be like trying to pump the gas and somebody's like, hey, can I get a picture? I'm like, no. You know, so you start to be dehumanized really early. And it's like people don't attach you to being a human. They automatically attach you to this thing. And I think college is no different from that. So finding ways to detach people from their identity making them have an identity in the sport. And that starts really early because a lot of people don't have those identity and they end up having an identity crisis. And that's where the depression for athletes come a, a long way because think about this. If you spend so much time doing something and then finally you don't reach your goal, it's a very traumatic thing. And a lot of athletes deal with traumatic issues that people don't really understand about you know, what it means to be an athlete. I want to go back for a second because you talked about food and, and your grandfather, and we talk, you talk about food in the book. Is that the beginning of you thinking about food, food justice? And, and I think so. It's interesting. This morning I was with my friend Josh, and we, we started talking about clothes, and all of a sudden we went straight to food, and we were talking about the essence of food, like what is it to be to eat, or like what does food do for you, or like cultural eating and food that makes you feel good. And I, when I think about those times, that's exactly what it was. We were eating food that my grandpa, grandfather grew. I knew how to grow it and all this kind of, all these different things that I didn't understand it, but I was like, oh wow, we eating, we, I put that watermelon, like that's my, you know what I mean? Like that's my yam or, or that's my goat that I fed or like this is my animal, I knew what it ate. And now when I look at uh, African American and brown communities all over the nation, native tribes. It's like people don't have access to fresh food. It's like, you know, I'm thinking like, how can we make a flying car, but people don't have fucking food? Like, this doesn't make, it doesn't sense. make sense. Like, I got an iPhone 8 and I can ask Siri anything. Like, Siri, where's the closest place that serves this? She'll tell me, Michael, it is on <laughs> Broadway in 23 and 30. You know what I mean? Like, she'll tell me. <laughs> But at the same time, I can't, like, find yeah. food for everybody. There's the homeless issues. So, like, food is a big issue when you look at uh, the brown and black communities because they have no access to it. You have to – there's no Whole Foods. Like, people are like, you know what? Let's put a Whole Foods in here and give everybody fresh food. That, people don't think like that because people know how valuable food is. Like, they'll put a new football field in the black community or the new basketball goal. And we're going to build a new park, and the park's going to have 10 basketball goals, and we're going to have NCAA coaches coming all the time. You're going to get a chance. But no 
nobody's going to be like, hey, let's build a whole bunch of gardens in these communities and show kids how to eat. Let's sell these food because they know how important food is and how many diseases come from lack of the right nutrition. And when I go around the world or go around the United States, I see those issues and I see why it's so important. And so like in this book, I wanted to be able to talk about those issues like food, like what is it to be hungry or what is it to you know search for the right food and, and not just telling somebody how to eat, but listening to them, listening to their culture, being connected to them and trying to understand why they like the certain things that they like and how to show them how to shop and stuff like that. So, You said cultural connection. You talked about how important going to Africa was for you. Can you share that with the audience? Oh, man. I think whew, that's, that's deep. Um, uh, so... So, let me see, like, I think, you know, growing up in America as an African-American man, you like, the story of an African man in America is a tragic story. It is an African-American person. If you listen to it, it's been persecution, it's been segregation, it's been dehumanization, it's been a struggle, death, birth, rape, slaves. So, growing up in America and just knowing that part of it, it's very hard to be like, connected to Africa because the history of this place just shows you that you never had value. The day one since I was here, I was a commodity. And it's no different. I'm playing in NFL and I'm still a commodity. So it's like being into Africa to me was like, it was the first time that I ever felt like I belonged. Like it was the first time that I seen me or I seen language or I was the, it was the essence of my ancestors, who, who they were, how they live, and how important it is to me to, you know, use them and use their power, use their strength, you know. I'm I'm Mandika, you know what I'm saying? So it's like You did your DNA? Yeah, yeah, so I did. Don't do don't do ancestry.com. That's not the real shit, all right? <laughs> <laughs> you got to do African ancestry by my friend Gina Page. She does the right thing. I know Gina. Straight. Yeah, That's what I did. Yeah, she she goes right to your DNA, goes right to your tribe. So, you know, being Mandika and then like understanding what that really means. Like what does that mean to be Mandika? And then to know that everything that I do now is already connected to my ancestors, connected to my grandmother, connected to my grandfather. And like, I'm here, like, I'm their story. Like, they didn't die in vain. And like, to take them to Africa and be like, welcome home. Like, they never, you know, when you think about them leaving Africa and like, riding on this boat for hours and like being beaten and being treated, done so bad in America, and I think about them, and I'm, I'm so honored to be, you know, the ancestor of somebody who's been through something like that. That just shows me that the resilience and the grit that my forefathers had is just amazing. So, you know, being in Africa like that, that was like me letting them know, like, your journey is not finished. I brought you home. So every night was an emotional night. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so every night was an emotional night for me because you know what it is to go to Gory Island and, and see, like, what people can do to people like yeah. it's like at some point in time it's like when is enough enough like to walk into a building and see a family snatched as i watch cnn i'm watching a family snatched same thing as i walk and i see people chain i look at now same change you know so it's like same thing so we've um so africa is just it was a very spiritual thing for me because it was me going home and like sitting every night, you know, being with my wife and understanding what that means for me and the family, like to teach my kids that, you know, yeah. their sisters is not just slaves, they kings and queens, so. That's right, that's right. <laughs> well, we, um, one of the reasons why I feel your book is so important because we look at the last five, 10 years in this country, Trayvon Martin, um, you know, Black Lives Matter, yeah. the rise of the current president, um, all the madness that's happening. Um, and you talk about your background growing up and this foundation being planted for you by your family. You know, um, how do you feel, you know, because you talk about all that we've been through in this yeah. country. How do you feel in these times? What gives you hope? And what are you thinking about and feeling? I think Africa re rejuvenated me. It took me to like, it took me somewhere else, like spiritually, like to be able to like, cause when you in this world, it feels like there's no hope, there's no change, there's nothing gonna come. But to know that, you know, through us, it's like people have the opportunity to, to change society. It's like, 
everybody in this room has the opportunity to make something change. Whether they choose to do it or choose not to do it is was really what pushes me to keep trying to make more hope and keep doing it because that's why I got hope because I see so many great people. I see young people, not like older people. I see young people. When I see, you know, the mass shootings and I see young people sitting on the stage and being like, we don't want any more gun violence. Or like, you see that kind of stuff, it makes you think that there's gonna be hope because these young people, they understand that it's their world. It's not our world anymore. It's their world to shape the way that they wanna shape. So all the things that they see and don't want, they make it sure that it happens. I feel like my generation was a little quiet. You know, we kind of got used to, you know, the iPads and, you know, creating you know, like the microwave society. We got so used to that, that we kind of let our voice kind of go silent for a little bit. But then like, now we got people who are speaking and now these young people are like, nah, this is our world, this is our time, we don't wanna do this and so you gotta respect them. So what gives me hope is young people. When I see my daughters doing the projects on different things and understanding the history, you know, I feel like my generation was not attached to history, like the history of who they are. They kind of just forgot like, oh man, like everything's so good, like I can I can do the, you know, the soldier boy, Ooh, like, like it wasn't like, it wasn't like, you know, like who's Booker T. Washington or, or who's, uh, you know, Thurgood Marshall, or like, you know, Langston, like it wasn't like intellectual, like James Baldwin, like there wasn't that kind of connection. But now young people, they like, they quoting these people and it's like, what, like how do you, you do that? So that's why I get all the hope from is young people. Uh, you um, may know that about five or six years ago, I wrote an open letter to black athletes and I talked about Muhammad Ali. Yeah. I talked about uh, John Carlos and Tommy Smith. I talked about Craig Hodges, yeah, yeah. a bunch of folks. But here's you. Here's Colin Kaepernick, here's Malcolm Jenkins, and a whole slew of black athletes um, that are fearless and unapologetic because you can literally lose, I mean, we see what has happened to Colin Kaepernick. Can yeah. you talk to talk about the role of the black I, athlete? I think, you know, when you look at like, you know, I look, some of these athletes I'm about to name, that I have nothing against them. I, love them, I love them for what they do as far as sports, all right? So, but if I think about like Kobe Bryant or I think about, you know, Michael Jordan, or I think about, you know, Scottie Pippen or, or King Griffey Jr. Or, or all these athletes, they kind of failed us as a little, a little bit because they didn't leave us any platform to like, like they let it skip a generation, you know? So they skipped, it skipped their, gener it skipped their generation to like, what it is to be an athlete. It came so much to money, like, you know, like they always say, give somebody what they want and they'll stop doing what you want them to do, you know what I'm saying? So they got mm -hmm. money and they kind of forgot, like, the struggle of, like, people that look like us or, you know, and so they left us for a little bit and it was kind of like, now my people, generation, everybody's like, wait, so what about Muhammad Ali? We need to, like, make that, like, you know, we would see, like, Martin Luther King on, you know, January and be like, oh, Martin Luther King, like, oh, and then, but forgot, you know, like, what, what it really is to be Martin Luther King, or we love Malcolm X, but what did it really mean to be Malcolm X, or what did Muhammad Ali risk, what did John Carlos risk, what did Harry Edwards risk, all these people risk great risk, but the people that we had to look up to, they didn't take any risk, the only risk they took was, like, should I sign with Nike or Reeboks, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> and so for, that's the case, we got, so now it's our job to, you know, when Colin took a knee, that was our job, that was our goal, like, let's go. Like, you know, before that, it was, it was LeBron, like, hey, look, too much gun violence, we're killing each other, we need to stop. It's like, okay, shit, we can't sit down. LeBron, if LeBron taking a risk, we, we, don't, have a, we don't have a choice but to take the risk, because LeBron got everything to lose, you know? So for us, it was like, we need to make sure that we speak our truth and, and keep our people moving forward and keeping people that are looking for us for a voice because that's what a role model is. It's like, you know, people always say, oh, I don't want to be a role model, but I want you to buy my shoes. Or I, want, I don't want to be a role model because I like to, you know, I like to be with a lot of women. Or I don't want to be a role model because, you know, being a role model when you, when you talk, it, it holds you to a certain standard of life. And are you willing to take that standard day in and day out? You are. Yeah. Wow. I have to ask, um, it seems uh, pretty evident to a lot of people, maybe you think differently or feel differently, that Colin Kaepernick will never be in the NFL again. Uh, I mean, I like to have hope, like, but I don't know what the future holds for him. I would love for him to get, to get the opportunity to play again, but as an athlete, you just you feel for him because it takes so much to get to that place to be in the position that he's in, the body of work that he's put together, and not to be able to have that voice anymore or do what he loves. You know, any, nobody wants to, 
to have something taken away that they love. And I think, you know, do I wish he could be in the NFL again? I do. Do I know? I don't know. But I do know there's a lot of great athletes that are doing a lot of work. And we talked about this earlier. And I feel that, that fans have forgotten, like, you know, fans, you know, when it comes to, like, picking sides, people still pick sides. Like, and it's no different when we talk about sports. Like, people, you know, they say, oh, well, Colin Kaepernick is doing this. That means if you're not doing this, then you're not doing anything. And I think that's a misconception of, of athletes because there's so many athletes who are really taking the risk that, like, I'm just in awe of, like, you know, whether it's bail reform or, or police brutality, women's rights issues. It's just a lot of athletes who are doing a lot of stuff. So there's still people that we can support that are out there playing. And I don't think that the fans should stop supporting certain guys, whether it's Malcolm, Kenny Stills, or Michael Thomas, or Russell Okung, Richard Sherman, like these people are still like, have a voice, so you still gotta support them, and don't pick a, don't make the other person who doesn't agree with you, you know, we were just talking about, just cause we don't agree with the method, doesn't mean that we shouldn't agree with what they're doing, you know what I mean? Because a lot of guys are doing a lot of work, and I think a lot of people are picking sides like, well, they're not following Cap or he's not doing that. But in the day, we got to look at the body of work. What is it that that person is risking individually? And I think there's a lot of guys who are doing a lot of work every day, in, every day, every single day when I talk to them. It's really unique. I mean, it's interesting because you are like a lot of the athletes, uh, football players who have protested yet again, a member of your family, your father, am I right? Yeah. Military man. Not just my father, tons of my great-great-grandfather's in the military. Everybody so, in my family has been in the military at so, some point in time. So how do you feel, like, if you could just say to people out there who are calling athletes, specifically black athletes, unpatriotic, ungrateful, you know, all these things that are being said about you all, just for civil, nonviolent protests. Uh, the real issue isn't about the flag or it's not about that. The real issue is that in their eyes, I'm seen as, as a nigga, and I should be grateful. The fact that I'm confident the fact that I'm intellectual is is scary to them because they understand that with this platform, being able to speak. So I, I don't really think it's about the flag. It's really about who we are as, as individuals. And I think, because if you really look at the flag, it's like, if you look at every single message everybody else said, it's not about the flag. And it's like, they'll be like, what's about the flag? He, he just said it's not about the flag. No, it's about the flag. No, it's not. You know, it's like, oh, what is it about? And you know, and it's like, the thing that I think that we could have did better was articulate our message properly. Like, what was it where we were believing in? I think because we were so, like, we weren't able to, like, intellectually express ourselves or articulate our, our message of what we believe in is that it kind of got lost and people started framing their our message. And another thing that happened is, like, people that said they were the media or looking for us, they were, you know, moderate and, you know, saying that they were liberals, but they really were trying to control our message to make it easy for other people to digest. But for us, I think we just needed to express ourselves a lot better. I think we needed to understand what we were doing. I think we needed to understand that it's so much more than just police brutality, the intersectionality of the whole perspective of oppressed people was like something that we were stepping onto the mainstream about. Yeah. But we just needed to articulate that. It's not just by police brutality. Because, OK, you can argue that if you want to. But can you argue you know, kids dying in Palestine? Can you argue you know, people being pulled from their family at the border? Can you argue Me Too? Can you argue all these things? Flint, Michigan, you can't argue and say that you're going to drink this water from Flint and say that we're saying something wrong. You can't argue all these different issues. So I think we just needed to combine everything and not just pick one thing so people can be like, well, you know what? They got a point. you know. Mm. So that's that word um, that we've been hearing around the country for the last few years, intersectionality, which you've talk, you talk about in the book. And so you see all these things as interconnected. Yeah, I mean, when first time I read Freedom is a Constant Struggle, I was just like, like, what is this? <laughs> and like, you know, to, to read something like that, to understand that it's not like so much about you because you want it to be just about me. Like, it's about me, me, me. But then it's like, well, if the people in Palestine are not free, then technically I'm not free. If the people in Rio de Janeiro are dealing with 
issues that I'm not free of. Jamaica, it's like every, if everybody is, isn't free, then we don't really live in a free society. And it's like the connection between all these people who are going through different different things, whether it's in Jamaica, you know, our connection between our African brothers who are in Jamaica that's just different, speak differently, or the people in the Dominican Republic or, you know, Haiti, it's like you go there and you're like, dang, it's like it's, it's bigger than just one thing. And it's like, how do you express that into a message? And it's like, the studying of that is something that, you know, it has a, you look at, you know, if I look at the Polynesian Islands or what they've done to the people in the Polynesian Islands, it's like, you look at the indigenous people around the world who are dealing with issues and then you're like, well, it's not just about me. And I think that's the thing that we had to uh, articulate when we were talking about the flag and, and, and intersectionality, really. One of the things that's come up, and I want to come back to what you talked about earlier about the impact of your wife and your daughters on you and just um, respecting women as equals. You know, people have argued that here the, the people are mad at the players for protesting, but clearly there's a problem with how a lot of the men treat women in the National Football League. Domestic violence is out of control. Can you speak to that? And what are some of the conversations that you as a man try to have, you try to have with uh, males in uh, the National Football League? I, I think the conversation is not so much males in the NFL. I think okay. it's just the male species in general. Okay. And so Fair it's enough. like, so it's like, we talked about keep the earlier is kind of like what being a man has changed so much, you know, trying to figure out, you know, am I supposed to cry? Am I supposed to be emotional? Am I supposed to be vulnerable? Am I supposed to be all these different things? So a lot of males that deal with all these different, you know, emotions that they can't express, you know, they don't know how to express them. And I think what we're trying to do in the NFL is like bring that to the forefront, like, look, hey man, if you're feeling a certain way, let that feeling out, like, so you don't get bottled up. And I think, you know, the issue with domestic violence has been a, a real issue. It's like people weren't gonna protest the 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 NFL when domestic violence was a big issue because it's like, but they'll protest the flag, you know, like oh they'll pro they'll protest that we're protesting the flag, but they wouldn't protest the NFL when they were doing domestic violence. So for us, is re bringing up those issues and showing that women are are equals. You know, a woman like when I was in Africa, a man broke down what a woman is. He was like, you know, a woman is the essence of life. A woman is the being that allows us to live. So to think that they don't have a place in this world is to think that you don't exist. And so therefore, we have to be able to share what women, women are doing. You um, became quite a, a member of the Seattle community. Yeah, and then it I think that's the thing I'm gonna miss the most, you know, like yeah. you, when you put so much into a city and you put so much into people, like for me, like, I don't think people like, well, football, they know people like leave and stuff. Or that town was more connected to me as a human, you know? And so I I still go there. Like I still live, I still have places there and I still am embedded in that community because everything that we built, like we made promises to people. My wife made promises to certain communities and I made promises to certain communities. And so we have to still like keep those keep those deals because those kids are looking up for us. Our communities are looking up for us to create opportunities. So we have to keep doing that. What was it like to win a Super Bowl? Winning a Super Bowl is always fun. I think <laughs> <laughs> I can't really explain how winning a Super Bowl is because it's. I still think sometimes people say Super Bowl champ, and I'm like, what? You know, you know. I yeah, you don't have your ring on, do you? I don't even know that thing's at. Like, <laughs> like for me, I don't like get attached to the thing of it. Like right. I get attached to the relationships, the people I met their families, that's what I was more connected to. Like, I would never share the same space with those same people. Some people that I met, or the people that I love from that team, or like, they all moved on, but we're still connected, like we're still talking, all those kind of things, because it was about the journey of each of us and what we've been through and how we supported each other. People's family died, you know, we still made it through, through those things because of support. I mean, you all, uh, when you were there, you had one of the greatest defenses in history. Yeah, yeah, we do yeah. have, sometimes I forget that. I, <laughs> I'm sure teams like my New York Giants won't forget that. Yeah, we, we beat the mess out of New York Giants and the Jets. Yeah, but keep going. Uh, well, the Jets, are they do they still exist? No. <laughs> no offense, Jets fans. I'm a Giants fan. And I, I got to say, when you uh, ended up with the Eagles, I was a little jealous because we could have used you in New York. Yeah, I think, you know, the funny thing is that I've never really been to Philly, so I don't really know anything about Philly. But then, mm. so, it was between the Patriots the Patriots. <laughs> you know where you are, right? <laughs> Patriots, Philly, and um, Atlanta. Like, I wanted to go to Atlanta, like, because I was like, this, 
black city. Like I'm ATL. ready. I'm ready. <laughs> I've been in the whitest city in America. I'm ready to go. <laughs> I'm ready. My family ready to go to the black city. You know. So, right. so I didn't really understand like what it means to be in Philly. Like mm. I didn't understand how the city was going like receive me and like how they were like man like come in this community and work. So yeah. I felt like with Philly it wasn't so much. Obviously, I'm still great at what I do, but no offense, you know what I'm saying? But, That's all right. <laughs> but it was about the people in the community, like the people in the community are looking for for me to come in and do work and my wife and all that. So it's like, that's the thing I like about Philly. It was beyond sports. It was about the impact that we can have in the community. Yeah, and I respect that. And um, if there are Philly folks out there, shout out to y'all for winning that Super Bowl and thank you for beating the Patriots. I just want to say that. Yeah, yeah. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm a New Yorker, so you know how we uh, Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know. Do. We play y'all twice this season. Yeah, we know this. Okay. 2 0 oh, oh, 2 oh, 2 for you. <laughs> and people are expecting y'all to go back to the Super Bowl. Yeah, ex I've done it before, so, right. I, so I understand the expectations and what it takes to get there, the dedication and what you have to do. So I think that's another reason why they brought me to Philly was to, like, you know, make sure that they have ex – the person who understands what it takes to be on a dominant team for a long period of time. And I think being there is something that I look forward to. It reminds me when Reggie White ended up with the Green Bay Packers and helped them win a Super Bowl back yeah. in the day. It's the same thing. And yeah. um, can you talk really quickly before we go to the audience just about um, uh, your relationship with your brother? You know, how important uh, that is to you? People always talk about, I mean, uh, my brother is obviously my one of my, probably my best friend outside of my wife, but mm. I don't consider my wife a friend. It's more like a soulmate type of thing. It's we in this thing, thing forever, so you can't leave me, even in the spirit life. <laughs> <laughs> I'll be right behind you. You'll be like, no, Jesus, I thought this was over. <laughs> I'll be right here watching Game of Thrones with you. Uh, Is that your favorite show? Uh, what am I? I like Game of Thrones. Okay. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Westworld, stuff like that. Like Westworld. I know. I can't right. watch it. All right. Um, so my brother, you know, we our relationship has been so tied in together. Everything we've ever done in life has just been so connected. So my relationship is, is easy. If, if today they said your brother needs a kidney and, and you can't play anymore, that's, that's nothing. You know what I'm saying? You like, that's, not, that's my brother. So, like, for me, that's, that's how close we are. So it's not about, it's about the relationship that we have within our family and then our wives and kids. So my brother's, you know, that's my best friend. So... Mm. Now I wanna, let's give Michael a round of applause, please. And um, Kaylin has a microphone. It's not over yet, please don't leave. We're gonna do a question and answer with Michael from the audience. We wanna definitely hear your voices. Uh, so if you have a question, just raise your hand and say your name, please. And uh, please know that we're uh, recording this as a podcast as well. From, yeah, for my I, podcast. I didn't know that. Yeah. It's, it, <laughs> It's, it's on Apple Music, uh, Apple Podcast. It's called One on One with Kevin Powell. One on One. One on One. Okay. Right on. Now, no, okay. Sorry about that. No. Is that all right? No, it's great. It's okay. even better. All right. I know y'all have questions out there. Well, so. since we're on this podcast, buy the book. Do I see an Eagles hat? I see an Eagles hat. All right. Well, first off, I want to say welcome to the Philadelphia Eagles. Thank you so much. Uh, are you from Philly? Out. I'm from uh, South Jersey. Like Philly's fan. Like, the know. Eagles fan. I got yeah. it. You know. Uh, what I just wanted to say, like, what. Do you think the NFL could learn from a league like the NBA, which is like a lot more pro player and you, I, you know? I actually think it's a misconception that the NBA is more uh, progressive than the NBA. I think people say that because, huh? Well, because I feel like people always say like the NBA is more progressive, but if you look at what we've done in the NFL as far as like holding our teams hostage to be like, this is what we want in our communities. And we held, like, nobody ever, like, like, they did pregame something, but nobody's ever, like, turned the world by what they've done. And I think the NFL is learning. I think the players in the NFL are more progressive because we have less leverage. The NFL, NBA has more leverage over, the players have more leverage over their league. So for us, I feel like we took a bigger risk because we don't have guaranteed contracts. We have to play through injuries. We have to do more. So I don't think the NBA is more progressive than the NBA. I mean, the NBA is more progressive than the NFL. I actually think the NFL is more progressive because when finally when they do take a stance, they really take a stance. They will create programs, they'll create different dialogues that are not around sports, just about making a change. Whether it's Breast Cancer Week or whether it's uh, Social Change Week that we got now, and now we holding each team to go into the community and make a change. And, you know, the the employers of the NFL had to talk about police brutality. So it was like, I don't think that was something that the NBA was doing outside of 
down to Sterling, which was a big thing they got him out the NBA. But shit, he made $2 billion. I would have left too. So it was like, <laughs> it wasn't like it was just something where he had to lose the essence of who he was or something like that. The, M the NFL players have done something I think in the league sports have never been done before, honestly. Questions? Questions? Yes. Uh, Mike, thank you, bro, for everything you do. Um, I'm a huge fan of yours, not just your athletic prowess, but your heart and all the hard work you're doing, uplifting our communities. Um, one of the things I've been struggling with as a young man is the, the ability to be vulnerable and emotional, yeah, yeah. right, growing up without my mother. Um, and you've been able to talk to that as a person uh, who's a father to three girls. How important do you think it is for young men, particularly young black men, to be in touch with our emotions and be vulnerable and be in oh, touch with man. our feelings? I think that's... I think if we were more connected to our emotions and our feelings, we'd be less killing. I think because we'd be connected to somebody and understand that, like, that's my brother, like, what death really means. And I think the ability for us not to be as vulnerable as we need to meet, be has devastated our ability to be fathers and to our, to our young children, has devastated our ability to respect our women because our lack of vulnerability. So I think vulnerability is one of the biggest steps that we can take as a community. And, you know, people talk about all these different things, but we need to look at why the problem is rooted so deep. And it starts with that, you know, that vulnerability, that empathy, that compassion. I don't think as a young black male, that's something that's taught. We taught like, you know, you got to be a gangster. Like, you know, you got to be Tupac. You got to be this. And then, but you love all these things about Tupac and all these things. But if you look at the core of this, it, like, Damn, like, he didn't respect women, like, you know what I'm saying? Or you look at Jim Brown, you're like, loved him. Damn, he didn't respect, you know, he didn't respect women. It's like, so looking at the deep-rooted issues of who we are as a people, I think vulnerability is something that we really need to focus on so we can move past this and, you know, be better fathers, be better brothers, be better humans to people that look just like us, you know? As much as, you know, that's the biggest argument I always hear, like, oh, it's police brutality, and then it's like, oh, well, black people are killing black people. I'm like... Shit, both of those are issues that, you know what I'm saying? So it's like the ability to be vulnerable for both, not just the ability to be vulnerable for when, you know, police kill one of us, but the, the ability to be connected when one of us kills ourselves, you know what I'm saying? And so it's like, so vulnerability is one of the biggest issues I think that's within our community. So it's important. As we pass the mic, um, question for you, racism and, you know, what do you s Answer for racism. Okay. I'm joking, but I'm <laughs> But, you know, some folks will see this title and say that, you know, you, have, you feel a certain way about white America, about white sisters and brothers. How do you respond to that? I don't hate anybody. I got white friends. I got black friends. I got Palestinian friends. I got Japanese. I got Japanese friends that I go to Japan. I can't even understand what they're saying, but we eating dinner. <laughs> they take me out the whole day. I'm in the car. I'm like, I don't know what he said. And I'm thinking when he get home, he said, I don't know what Michael said. But somewhere along the line, we eat food. Like... I meet people and the first thing I do, I don't never see an enemy, I see a human. You have to show me that you're an enemy before. And so I meet, I meet people every day and I become my friends because I'm like, you know, I wanna be able to not assume anymore. I wanna be able to assume that a person has a good heart, you know, to be able to, you know, do that. And, and for when I think about that, I don't think, I don't have any issues with white or white people or in general. And I, I don't see a white person be like, oh, that guy's racist. You know what I mean? Like, oh, oh, he doesn't, he doesn't cook. He doesn't put salt in his food. I don't say that when I see white people. <laughs> Even but you got that from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> but a lot of my friends don't put salt in their food, and sometimes I'm like, "Dude, please put some salt on this fried chicken." <laughs> but I love. I don't have. A, I don't have an issue with anybody. But I do have issue with you know colonialism. Mm. I do have an issue with you know the jail system. I do have a problem with you know you know the bail system. I do have a problem with you know you know people dying every day. I have a problem with those things. If you got a problem with the institutes institutionalized way of thinking of America, then I, I have a problem with that, but I don't hate people. I hate the idea of some of the structures that are created around people to hate each other. You know, not I don't hate religion. I respect somebody that's Muslim. I respect somebody that's Buddhist. I respect anybody that's doing their own thing. You know what I'm saying? Because I see people for humans. So I don't see, I don't always see color when I see people. You know what I'm saying? So most of the time, I see just a person being a human being. I mean, if they unveil themselves as being a racist, I'm like, oh shit, he is a racist. You know what I mean? Like, but at the same time, I don't hate anybody, honestly. Who had the mic? Oh, yes, sir. 
All right here, uh, Michael, man, thank you for, uh, yeah. for your words, man. Uh, Aaron Green uh, from South Carolina. It's two things that you said. Uh, you mentioned uh, Brazil. Uh, I thought about the favelas in Brazil and Palestine. Um, and you having this global justice perspective, um, it reminded me of uh, towards Malcolm's end of his life where he was going to put America on trial, the UN, or yeah. beyond Vietnam speech, um, or the Black Panther Party having a global movement. Um, my question to you is, since America is oppressing the most vulnerable in America, but also oppressing people across the world, how do we continue to cultivate a movement um, that is going to speak for the most vulnerable around the world? Um, I don't think I can say that in public, but meet me on the side, we can talk. <laughs> That's mad I'm real. I'm serious. That's mad real. That's mad real. I'm dead serious, so yeah. Yeah, yeah, we can talk after. Yeah. Questions? We have a lot of hands. Kalen, how are we doing on time? Okay, cool. How you you doing, good? Uh, how you doing, Michael? My name is Clayton Griggs. What's up, man? Uh, I live hey. here in New York. Um, so um, you spoke on being articulate and things like that, um, especially getting points across, uh, especially along the media and things like that. Um, you know, with all these brothers not really getting a full education, is there something maybe in place with the NFL or through a bunch of guys, like making sure that these men that have a word, that have something to say, that they're speaking articulate and making sure their point is getting across and not, you know, misconstrued or anything like that. I think that there's a lot of media training, but I also think it's just like for the young players or the athletes that are in the connection or, you know, in the struggle or talking about different things, it's also just to get connected with people who are doing this so they can educate you. And so it's just about meeting people and sh helping them guide you, asking for help, man. Like, I really want to talk about bail reform, but sh I don't know where to start. Can you help me? So that's the thing that we're trying to do within the NFL is to bring, like, people who are doing work and then letting people get, you know, attached to or work with them. Or, and in my book, we talk about Athletes for Impact, and that's exactly what Athletes for Impact is. It's a, a global organization which was in sports to connect people for things that they don't understand, but they want to understand, and where they can be safe and, you know, do their op-eds or do their work. They could do it quietly or they could do it in front of people, whichever one they like. And so that's how we try to do it. Mm. Hands. Oh, the mic's back there. Okay. Hey, Michael, thanks for everything that you're doing. Um, there's a lot of, I mean, not a lot, there's some white people who are getting not just uncomfortable, but really angry. And there's other people that are taking advantage of that. And there's like an attempt to start a white supremacy movement in this country. And they're in the White House. I'm from Berkeley. I think it's happening. Yeah, yeah, no, no, but like. I think and, trying is, you missed it, yeah. Yeah, no, no, for real, I'm, I live in Berkeley. There's like, there's people in the streets fighting and like, there's, you know, you, I'm sure y'all have seen the videos yeah. like people getting beat up by literal Nazis in the streets. Like, believe me, like I, I see it happening. And I think that you are playing a role in pushing back on it. And I just, I'm wondering about what your thoughts are on that. And then Berkeley especially, they do stuff that's crazy. Like they, they all the Nazis get together and say, we're rallying for free speech, right? And it's, it's like a joke, but people take it seriously. And then people who are on the field trying to nonviolently protest are getting shut down and there's calls for them to get fired. So I'm just wondering what you think about all that. Oh, that's a lot of stuff. I think, <laughs> I think we just, what is, so what is the question like this? Yeah, so, I'm, so. Yeah, what, do you, like, what do we do to push back on white, what do, you, what do we do to push back on white supremacy and what do you think about this whole idea of them being about free speech? I think we, I think we just gotta continuously use our voice and just continuously go out and vote, continuously change our communities. I think we can't be as afraid to not do what we need to do because of what other people think or how people feel about it. So I just think you just gotta keep fighting. You just gotta keep pushing forward regardless of the structures or what's happening. I know sometimes it feel like you know, there's so much sorrow that you just cannot keep going, but we can't stop and be like, These, they're doing this, so we gotta stop. So now nah, we just gotta keep working, man. I think it just get back into the fields and just working and working with other people around us is just to keep you know, changing the things that we don't like. And I think we, those, those tactics are the scare us from speaking the truth, but we have to just keep going. Organize, 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 basically. Keep organizing. Kayla? Yes, I'm sorry. Hi, uh, thank you, Michael, for all you do. Um, I'm a huge Eagles fan, so I hope you lead us to this is Super Bowl deep. this year. Yeah, Eagle um, got more Eagle fans in New York than I'm Eagles saying. Fans. Yeah, I'm, <laughs> I'm saying. Anyways, uh, my question is, uh, a lot, I don't have a statistic for this, but I know that a lot of professional athletes uh, go broke uh, once they're out of the league. I know that your brother is um, working as a 
I think is a ch- uh, child book cartoonist now. And so my question to you is, what are your plans for after football? And how can a Great professional question. athletes start? That's uh, not that's not a good question. Not a good so question. basically he said, <laughs> what you going to do not to go broke? That's basically what he asked me. <laughs> That's what yeah. that's, that's not is that not the question like I'm trying to like can I rephrase it for yeah, him then yeah I'm trying to like yeah. understand so you saying can what am I gonna do not to go broke or no, like no. <laughs> my my question is what are your plans for after football and how can professional athletes uh, not go broke not not yourself. so he did ask the question Other. then <laughs> I was trying to clean it up for you homie <laughs> nah I think but I think I think a lot of times when people look at athletes going broke they forget they don't look at the Look at the whole bottom line. Like, okay, an athlete, he, not everybody has a multi-million dollar contract. That's the first misconception of sports is that everybody has a LeBron James contract. And like, now if LeBron James go broke, we have an issue. Yeah. <laughs> so, but a lot of players, like, you know, they make $400,000 a year. Uh, so then they go, boom, let's get 250, right? And then like, that'll pay an agent 3%. That's another 35, 40,000 gone, boom. And then they have to pay for all this other stuff that comes along with it. So they're only left with like a hundred and something thousand dollars. And then, so they, they try to live off that for a couple of years. And everybody knows a hundred something thousand dollars is not going to last you forever. And so a lot of guys just have to find ways to like, you know, find their jobs and get involved with different things. But there's a lot of programs that guys could do to find out what's, what's their hobbies and what do they like and how do they can, you know, make more money. But at the end of the day, I think the biggest thing is that a lot of guys don't make that much money. You hear, you know, very few stories of guys who made the most money who lost it all. There's a couple of those. But if you really look at the underlying of people who are losing all their money, it's really guys who were undrafted, you know, first, second year guys who didn't make it a lot, who dealt with injuries, they have to pay for surgeries. You know, you add two, three baby mamas to that, you know. That's a lot of money. You don't really, you never really get a chance to really make money. What was the player that played for the Jets that had, like, 15 kids? Uh, Yeah, 13, but... Hermione, but he's he's doing he's doing good. I like his show. He got a family show on TV, <laughs> and my kids love that show. That show is one of the most. It's one of the best shows on TV because he's just being a good father and trying to. Re- he's trying to do he's it. He's trying to do it, and I think sometimes in society, it's like we won't let people we won't let people change. Like we won't let mm. people evolve. Like like when Kanye West said that, everybody was like, "That's it, Kanye's dead to me." Like nobody was like. Let's let's go talk to Kanye and see. Like it was like there's no dialogue, and that's what's wrong with the world right now. There's never any dialogue. Yeah. It's like when somebody does something we don't like, it's like that's it. That person's dead to me. Cut off. I don't care if that's my sister. She didn't bring my iron my high iron back. Like that's it. Like she's dead to me. Like I'm not. Even, so people just you know cut people off, and there's not a chance to have dialogue, and so that's a big issue with that. We so we got a lot of hands. Yeah. Hey, what's going on? Th- thanks y'all for doing this. I really appreciate Thank it. You Thank you for, you being for coming. Y'all do. Um, a question that I have based on the book, which I loved, um, talks about like food and you know nutrition and all of that stuff. And I know you were saying like how um, sometimes athletes and you know entertainers they put out to like promote like McDonald's and all of this yeah. other stuff. And oh. That was Michael Jordan. Uh, is that the, I, they, they, they promote, like, fast food, and, you know, they, they're not eating this stuff. So, like, <laughs> could you talk a little bit about, like, the it. role and the importance of, like, food in your life and nutrition and health and all that and promoting that to the young, the youths especially? I mean, food to me is how I started my foundation. My foundation was based on food, based on gardening, based on, you know, how do we change uh, – the ideas of food, like how do we take a family and tell them to eat healthy, but we don't show them how to eat healthy. We're telling somebody, go eat. And it's like, well, I only have 15 to $20 to eat, so tell me how to eat healthy. And so those are the things that we try to do in our foundation is to show people like, you can't eat healthy on the budget. And food is so important to the culture. Like, you know, a lot of diseases that we get is from the food that we eat. You know, this morning I got a whole lesson on mucus and like how, what mucus does to your body and like, that is the truth, like food is how we stay alive. It's the most important thing. Most people will think, the other day I was driving to uh, meet with this guy in LA and we had a production meeting and I was talk- talking to him and a lady crashed her car. Boom, she hit the side of the road and her car was on fire. And I was like, damn, I gotta go save this lady. I'm like, damn, I hope nobody see me saving this lady. I hope I don't get burnt up. But I went in there and boom, we got to kick the door open, mm-hmm. open the door. I was like, she, she all knocked out, like she just got hit by Tyson and stuff. And then, wow. and then she just like this, and then I was like, I was like, come on, get out the car, your car on fire. She was like, no, I can't leave my phone. Wow. 
So as wow. much as people think that like things like their phone matters or like yeah. you know Twitter, Instagram, all these things matter, they really don't. It's like food is the most important thing that a human can consume. And so for me, finding ways to talk about that again, like culturally, what it, you know, those things are important. And my wife trying to listen to her, like saying like, let's listen to people and try to understand them. Like, let's not go into the meeting and being like, you need to eat kale, you need to eat this, you need to eat that. Because we have to understand a culture's palate. And my wife is always like that. We need to understand the culture. Like we need to do that to make sure that when we do go in there, we can help them design something about around the way that they eat respecting their culture, respecting mm. how they do things. And I think that's why food is so important to me because I know what food can do to you. I know how food can change your life. I know what food can do for you for as far as health, you know? So food, that's why, you know? Wow. I'm a vegan. Are you a vegan? No, not yet. I, I keep telling, I was just talking to Linda that I was going to um, be a vegan. And then she was like, you want to try this lamb? And so I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Who has the mic? I'm sorry. Hi. My name is Kath Talbot, and um, I'm really glad to be here. And the book cover arrested me at the Strand earlier today, yeah. and that's how I ended up here. Oh, thank it, you. Yeah. And, um, but of course, everything that's in the book is so different from what I assumed would happen yeah, I when I would. saw the front. <laughs> that's the whole point. It's like, yeah. open the book. Okay. Information. So, so the two wow. questions. The two questions are, one... Having a mom who loved books, what does it mean to you to have written one? And two, why is there no hard copy of this book in the New York Public Library system? Yeah. I blamed it on my publisher. <laughs> now I'm joking. I don't know, I don't know yet, because it's like, uh, the books that athletes usually write are not like something in political or why they're playing. So a lot of people are just getting hip to like, like who I am as a person and what I believe in. So I think it's just the timing of it. I think over time people will just start to realize like, oh wow. I, I don't think my mom even read the book yet. I, I, I gave her, I just gave her one recently and I was like, I didn't really make a big deal around my house or my family because I just didn't want to be like, oh, I'm ready, gloating and stuff. But I think a lot of my, some of my family, my sister, a lot of people read it. My, um, so, but at the end of the day, I think everybody's proud of me to be able to know that a lot of the stories that that I'm talking about is stories that through their eyes and things that I experienced with them, and I'm just representing them in a positive manner. Mm. Questions? Who has the mic? This is going to be the last question. That's all we have time for. Okay. We just got one more question. That He's had his hand up for a while. Yeah. Well, I can pass. I can Another access one? later. Huh? Oh, okay. No, 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 please. So I have a question about the Me Too movement. Yeah. And just from like the long history of men that are either in entertainment or men that feel like they have a sense of power, I would love to know, after the Me Too movement, have athletes been talking about, or have they been slowing down in the way that they treat women, or has it been an open conversation? I and also, I've heard about NDAs, just because I am in the entertainment world. So I've indie? heard that now they're getting very smart, and they're making women sign NDAs before they go into the houses. Is it an app? Huh? I don't know what <laughs> it is. I just know that people are getting very clever now, so I wonder, is it an open conversation that you men are having? And someone like you, are you speaking to the men or are other I people think, speaking to the men I think a lot of times about it? I don't know for everybody, but some of my friends, a lot of guys are, I, most of my friends are married, so, so like, I don't really know what every guy is talking about, but I do see a lot of the locker room people are bringing up these issues, and is it going on? There's a, it was a lot of, a lot of dialogue, because some people were like, some of these, some people are, were like, you know, like, what if she's lying or this, and it was like, so and other people are like, no, we need to hear the story before we make an assumption about what the story was. I think there's this big thing that a lot of women were like not telling the truth for to get ahead in life. And for us, especially with men's with daughter, we're like, that's not true. I think I was, you know, we talked about that a lot in the locker room. Like, how do we not victimize the victim? And so mm -hmm. that was a lot of what the conversations were. And I think a lot of guys are, you know, aware of these things. I think people have always been aware of them, but, you know, I believe that always people only do what they're allowed to do. So now that things have changed, it's like now people will not be allowed to do those things anymore. I think society has allowed people to get away with things like that, whether it was racism, it wasn't, at first it was this, and it was like, wait, so we can't be racist anymore? Okay, or we can't be have slaves anymore. Like they knew that they couldn't do it, but they were allowed to do it. So I think a lot of guys are getting to the state where they're just like, you know, we need to do more, we need to do better, so. Mm. Yes, sir. How's it going? My name is Josh. I'm from right outside Philly, so thank you. Um, <laughs> Did y'all get bust in or something? 
<laughs> right from the link. Okay. Yeah. Um, it pains me to say me and my little brother don't see eye to eye with our family entirely. Uh, some people in our family are very traditionalist. Oh, it's been this way. It should be this way. Some of them are very upset about, you know, the way the NFL is going. All that he and I are, you know, very much reading everything that you and Malcolm and everyone else say. How do we really stand up to that as we're consistently being, you know, shut down time and time again? What I would say was, as you get shut down time and time again, put yourself in the shoes of the mother of Michael Brown. That's going to give you energy to know that this change or Sandra Bland or people that are going through real issues. And every time you think like, I can't do it again, be like, man, there's a reason why. Because things that are happening has to propel me to keep pushing forward. So you have a big role in not trying to change society, but changing your family is just, it's a hard enough thing to do. So, you know, keep bringing up the real issues of what is really happening to brown and black people around this world. And I think you just have to keep going, man. Keep fighting, keep pushing. Don't get scared to stand on your truth, man. You know, I always say, man, stay true to you. You know, you know, don't stay true to what they believe. Stay true to what you know your heart, where your heart is. Your heart is full of empathy. Your heart is full of compassion. So don't lose that because your family's telling you, don't be empathetic to those people. It's our way. No, be like, nah, it needs to change, you know. So I just would just tell you just to keep fighting, man. Mm. And just keep channeling everybody around you. Because if you don't, you're going to look back in 20 years and be like, damn, I wish I would have done more. So just keep going and keep pushing forward. Wow. I want to give... Um, we got one last one back there. Which one? In the, right back there? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so um, my question would be, like, it's kind of like similar to his. Like, if a person decides to pe peacefully protest on the football field, they're looked at as a traitor when they're pe uh, protesting the national anthem and stuff. But if and then if they go and try to um, protest, like, in the streets and march, they're looked at as a rioter. So those people that are calling, like, rioters or, like, saying they're the traitors, they, I, I, I believe that they're, like, actively trying to not listen. So how do we get our message across to those people? I think we just have to keep saying our message. The moment we go silent, then we become dishonest. You know, once we silence our voice, then they won't have to listen, but if we keep yelling and amplifying it. It's not about just the individual, it's about the collective. Like, we have to keep getting people beside us to keep yelling and keep pushing up, organizing, and just continuously grow as a people. Like I said, that's all you really, that's all we really can do, because we can't force somebody to listen, because then we will be just like them. You know, we want to get them to change, not just physically, but we're trying to change people spiritually. And that's where the real battle is really fought. It's fought on a spiritual level, because right now, you know, I feel like our bodies are just moving right now and like our minds are being controlled right now. But our spirits are the things that, that we don't see that are always fighting. So we have to continuously, you know, evolve spiritually so we can be able to have the equipment to move around this world. Mm. Michael, we got to wrap this up. Um, but I need two quick predictions from you. First, this season for the Philadelphia Eagles. Super Bowl. Okay. okay. <laughs> and then... I hope my Giants do something. They suck last year. They will year. do something. They're going to lose. They're going to lose. <laughs> Second question, um, just as important. Uh, Michael Bennett, author, activist, feminist, environmentalist, leader. Where do you see yourself 10, 15 years from now? Um, driving to Howard University to drop my daughter off to college. No. Ah, that's I right. Don't know, I don't know where I see myself. I, like, I, don't, I just try to live like try not to like put too much in it. I want to be in the present. You know, I'm more like, how do I be more present daily? And I mean, I got to do that first before I like can conquer 15 years from now. So like, I'm just trying to deal with the daily you know, pressures and the daily societies, the daily tasks of being a husband, being a father. And those are the things that I look up to or I try to do, you know what I'm saying? So um, that's why I see myself as just trying to like focus on the daily. I think that's a big enough battle is to be present. And I think that's what I try to do often. Let's give a round of applause for Michael Bennett, author of Things That Make White People Uncomfortable. <laughs>